Um, all right, well, Praise the Lord. yes, amen. amen. Ginger, you want to open us up in prayer? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for who you are and how you do deal with us and reach us and encourage us and bless us and help us. And I thank you for this class and what an encouragement and blessing is to all of us, I'm sure. And we just praise you, Lord, for what you're going to do in each one of our lives and how we will be able to use this whatever way you show us to. May we be attentive and encouraged today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we get started, can I actually share how this class has already helped? Sure. In a certain situation? That it would be encouraging. So over Christmas, um, <coughs> we have some old friends that we served with in Mali, and they have recently moved to another country um, over in West Africa. Billy's going to visit them on his West Africa trip. And she texted me maybe two weeks before Christmas and was like, did you have any trouble with Turkish medication and da 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 da? Um, it turns out that she was on antidepressant and it had kind of stopped working. Um, and so um, she was asking like, is Turkish medicine okay? Do they have regulations and da da da? I was like, well, we've never had a problem with Turkish medicine when we were over there, you know, it was it was fine. We used the local medicine all the time. Well, not all the time, but yeah. Um, so anyway, I just started asking, like, do you think your feelings could be a result of all the changes that you're going through? And she's like, well, I don't feel like I'm that stressed or da da da. And I'm like, well, I'm so sorry for having to deal with this during Christmas time. That sounds super hard. And um, you know, is there anything other than praying for you? Is there anything else I can do for you? And um, and then at the end of that text, I just simply put, is there anything that you're thinking about that brings up the emotions regularly? You know, is there any sort of pattern that you've noticed? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, going back to those things that we've seen in, from the movies, or not the movies, the, the, the talks, the videos, and what we've talked about and, and things like that. And so I just asked the question, and she never got back to me. Well, it's Christmas time and everybody's busy, so I kind of just let it go. And she texted uh, a few days ago and said um, basically that her and her husband had talked and it did turn out that she was missing her old Christmases, what she knew and what she loved. Um, and so they were able to get away and um, take a few days and run the air conditioner 24 seven. <laughs> <laughs> um, enjoyed the pool with their kids and, and she was feeling a lot better. Yeah, wow. just that reset. Yeah. yeah. Just helping her to, you know, because of this class and what I learned, right. helping her to refocus not on the medicine, on the diagnosis, but maybe where her thoughts are going, right. her feelings and things like that. Right. So that's just really so, good. That's so you guys good. know that the Lord is already using it in some pretty big ways. Oh, that's encouraging. Thanks, God. Well, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, obeyed the, uh, the Lord and sent that last little text to her. Great. Praise God. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, um, and the last, uh, the Peacemaker one, you know, I brought in those circuit jammers, too, because, uh, you know, as, as you guys, as we move forward, you're going to see that communication is such a huge part of conflict or the lack of or, um, you know, sometimes it's uh, manipulated. Sometimes it's just poor communication. But anyway, you're going to see that communication plays such a key role. So I, I thought that we'd have a little fun with the circuit jammers. And um, just kind of to make us more aware that, and this is something you're going to learn moving forward too, that, um, you know, no matter how proper our behavior uh, of, of the outer man of our behavior, but our behavior is defiled if the motives and intentions of our heart are impure. So that's what you want to focus on through the from teachings from here on out is um, motives and intentions of the heart. And, you know, are they wrong? Are they wrong motives and intentions of the heart? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what you're going to start learning as we move forward. And, in fact, Peacemaker 3 starts even talking about how, you know, pride's the biggest peace breaker that there is. And also that you have to confront sin in order for there to be peace. And I know people don't look at it that way, but as the teachings start going, you're, you're going to learn that, too, because I... <coughs> Les and I were talking about how the first half of our classes, um, we see, you know, we sense a little resistance to why is 
um, confronting sin always being brought up in almost <laughs> every class, but I think you guys will see why that is as we start to move forward now, and that's because it has everything to do with the person's heart. So it's certainly if you're counseling a couple, there's two, you know, mm -hmm. and um, even if you're just counseling one person, it's usually a conflict with somebody else, a family member or a friend or something like that. So that's what the counselors try to do is separate, you know, separate things out for them. Um, so today we're going to look deeper at that diagram, the slippery slope. You guys have that on page 42. And it, it, what it does is talk about responses to conflict, how people react. And I kind of messed this up. I didn't realize less would have a hard time uh, reprinting it. But so find it either on your peacemaker pamphlet that I need you guys, or else page 42. Is it on there, you guys? On page 42? Yeah. It should be. My book's different than you guys. Yeah, that's the one. So these are the responses arranged on a hill. And the idea is that, you know, imagine yourself, imagine the hill covered in ice. And if you go too far to the left or too far to the right, then a lot of things are going to start happening and, and building up. And so that was the purpose of this. Is um, and uh, I know that Ken Sandy, who wrote the book, he was trying to break this down. Like uh, these three on the left, suicide, flight, denial. Uh, these are escape mechanisms. That's for people who absolutely, definitely just want to avoid any conflict at all. And Ken Sandy calls that peace faking. All right, and then in the turquoise here, these are commands by God empowered by the gospel. I wanted to make that clear. Uh, the first three are personal peacemaking. So sometimes you overlook. Sometimes communication, <clears throat> negotiation, um, mediation. Now, to me, when you start with arbitration, now you're involving more people. And when you involve more people, now you're going to get an imposed result instead of just people being able to work it out between themselves. So um, and then of course, church discipline, that's why it's under God's command, empowered by the Gospels, because there is uh, you know, church discipline in Matthew, how, how that's done for conflict that can't be resolved. And um, definitely on this side, litigation, assault, murder. So this is peace breaking. And if you'll notice, this group here are people who are focusing on you. This is focus on me to the left. Um, and so if you want to have your eyes on God, I think that's why Ken might have put that up here at, at, at the top. And I can tell you guys, whenever you involve litigation, and some of you guys might already know this, but when you involve litigation, you have to know that uh, once you've entered the legal system, you've entered a very adversarial system. Your attorney's paid to make you look faultless and paint the defendant as the one who is entirely responsible. And then that takes a devastating toll on everybody involved and even has a ripple effect. And like, I'll, I'll give you a good example. When I was in the legal field, and we would have a married couple coming in, they're, they're wanting to get divorced, they have children, of course, child support now becomes involved. I tried my best to get them to, you know, let's talk this out, let's figure this out, let's take a look at your finances, let's, you know, let's work this out. And one was very revengeful, and so if you have a person with a revengeful heart, it's not gonna go well. And what happened was he pushed for it to be done through uh, Missouri statutes, which ended up making the comp, by the time they did the state computation for child support, he had to pay her way more than what we were discussing quietly in our office. And so there's a good example. So if you have, you know, a heart full of revenge, you're going to wind up with long-term consequences. So, um, let me see. But I, the, the thing I want to point out the most, though, is every time that the scripture talks about our hearts, it's talking about our mind, will, and emotions. And I think we learned that in the first couple of uh, classes. So throughout scripture, the word heart is referring to the center of our being, which is our mind, our will, and emotions, which is why we look at motives and intent, because behavior follows. So uh, in the context of a counselor, 
uh, in Philippians 2, 3 and 4, the first time I read that, I was, I was thinking, wow, that is fundamentally what is wrong with people today. When you, when you have somebody that's full of conceit and selfish ambition, um, let me see, as Counselor, the Holy Spirit brings that to light. When we bring this to Scripture and say, oh, okay, so in the context of a counselor, a counseling room, what you want to do is have the counselee take a look at the Scripture and have them take a look at the things that you're noticing in them. And I heard that some of you guys are working on a log list. Do you know what that is, the, a log list? That's where you, and, and uh, Jim's going to talk about that today, where he has his counselees literally wipe, write down a list of, their, their own sins, like when they examine their own heart, they write that down. And so if you have both parties doing that, and then you, you help them work through that. So it's called a log list where you write that down. But you take them to scripture and show them what it says about selfish ambition, what it self, says about conceit. And um, Ken Sandy was talking about how most conflict in relationships is unmet wrong motives and intentions from within. And uh, James speaks to jealousy, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition as well. So that, you know, and, it, and it's true in his book, James's book, he's talking about the church. But if you think about the body of Christ individually, usually what's going on in their hearts will spill out in the church. And that is when you do wind up with um, church discipline. So in James 3, it says, For where bitter jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every evil practice. And the first time I read that, I thought, man, that's quite an indictment. Um, in the legal field, that means a formal charge of a serious crime. So, and if you're talking about bitter jealousy, that's a heart that's gathered anger, covetedness, resentment, and... Um, Mark 7 speaks very strongly to jealousy and resentment and its cohorts and uh, just the whole list going on and on. So you have counselees come in and they have all that going on. And so you have to take them to scripture, figure out which way they headed before they came into your office. Um, James, the book of James, I love the book of James because he talks about the heart a lot and what's going on in a person's heart. And he, he went, in his book, he focuses on, um, you know, the, he focuses on those who are fighting and not necessarily the fighting itself. And so I turn to his book a lot when I'm doing counseling. Um, but the point is that it's unmet, wrong motives and intentions of the heart. When people come in, that's usually what they're, what's going on with them. Paul called it the war within. So, uh, he himself experienced it. It's, he, he describes it as two inner forces struggling for the mastery of his body, which I loved that explanation. But moving forward, we'll learn that in order to be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker, we have to change at the heart level. That's the key to the peacemaker. And that you know, change has to come from within. And we have to become aware that, of that those things in our counselees' lives that's fighting for their affections, and their affections belong to God. So um, they need to get rid of that. All right, but I did want to read something that was interesting. Ken Sandy had put a testimony, and then we'll start the video. Uh, um, he put a small testimony about he himself and his heart that, uh, in regard to something that was going on in his home with his own family. And he writes, when we search our hearts for our motive and intent, we often find multiple layers of concealment, disguise, and self-justification. -just One Sunday, I was so angry with my children throughout the week, I had been trying to convince myself that all I wanted was for them to obey God's commandments and to honor their parents and to love one another. But as my anger intensified, it became apparent that there was another desire lurking deeper in my heart. What I really wanted was to be able to come home to peace and quiet, to smiling children, to a loving, undistracted spouse. I realized it was not for God's glory, but for my own comfort and convenience. There's not a one of us that hasn't felt that way in some context at some, at some time. But um, I thought that was very interesting for him to share something you know, that personal. And then he quoted the scripture, Proverbs 4.23, saying, Our hearts are the wellsprings of all our thoughts, desires, words, and actions. Therefore, it is also the source of our conflicts. So, 
think about that. Well, I'm sorry that this this is kind of right. Then well, would you? Say? Yeah, it's, it's kind of right. But I have so many. Well, years. go by what you guys have. Yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you, Caleb. I was about ready to take my sweatshirt off too when I found out that was the wrong diagram. So we just got to roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you guys, what I would like to say, I mean, that, that's all pretty self-explanatory, so you probably don't have any questions. And, um, did you guys get the answers to the questions for this, for this part two? Uh, on the back, here's what I'd like to point out. Jim did a really good job with this, is that forgiveness is a decision, not a feeling. That's mm -hmm. really good to remember. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I love that he shared about the, the, the six-figure you know, money that he, he's shared that a couple times. Uh, you know, he had to, how he has to kind of walk around in a Christ like attitude. Ho he's still hoping and praying that this gentleman will come and um, repent and talk to him, even if he doesn't pay him back. He's, he wants to be in an attitude where he's ready to forgive him, you know, if he, if he does come around. So I love that. That's, that's the Christian walk. I don't and, really understand you that. Do, you don't understand that? I don't understand that you don't forgive them until they ask. But you're ready to forgive. No, I think he's walking around in an attitude of, of forgiveness so that he's ready to say that to the guy if he ever comes up to him. Because I but think it's otherwise. Like he's already forgiven. Yeah. yeah. He just wants to tell him. Right. Right. Because otherwise, I think you wouldn't function very yeah. well as a. Yeah, as a or person. he wants the other guy to ask for forgiveness, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, he says, I'm, I'm hoping someday he'll come around. Well, he, I think it's what he worried was so they can more fully forgive him. Right. The full fruit of the forgiveness could right. be that you would ask me and I would forgive you. Yeah. I've already forgiven you, but if you would ask me, that would fulfill the whole, you've come to me and asked me, and yes, I'll forgive you. Yeah. So that you that, know That's I exactly forgive. right, Tom. And he walks around in that state of mind. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I love that. Um, you know, Naya, was, you asked me about, has anybody ever threatened to murder somebody in, in my office? No. But I have, I did have to get kind of creative because a, a wife who had been offended by an affair um, uh, after a service, was before the service was even over, in fact, it was a lady, I was, count, I was counseling the wife, and um, she came and grabbed me and kind of pulled me out of a, uh, out of a service. She said, she's here. She's here. Who's here? The, the mistress. The mistress is here. And I'm waiting until she comes out through that door, and I am going to pounce. And I was like, whoa, whoa, no, whoa, wait a minute. Uh-uh. Okay, let's rethink this. Let's calm down. <laughs> rethink this. And so I did have to, um, I let the pastor know what was going to happen if I did not get to mediate a meeting between the mistress and the wife. So um, we asked the mistress if she'd be willing to meet with the wife. She was agreeable. Uh, and so and I had to give this a lot of prayer and a lot of thought because I didn't know how this would turn out. Um, and so I asked the wife to submit some questions that I would allow her to ask the mistress because you want to have some control over that because there's things that just don't need to, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't serve a purpose. It's not productive. So she did that. I allowed the questions to be asked. And as the meeting progressed, the mistress began to just sob. She saw the wife as a very Christian, loving, soft-spoken, forgiven woman, which she was. Um, and I think she, it might have not been that way if she did. Pastor? <laughs> yeah, got her at the door as Probably church. Was, and, and I did let the at pastor church. know what was going on, just, you know, and that we, we wanted to do it this way. But, um, yeah, and she was sobbing and asking the wife for forgiveness. And um, it helped heal the wife a little to have that happen. Now, I don't know. I think that'd be a case-by-case -case thing. I, it's not something I would certainly recommend. It just happened to work out that way. You know, she walked into the church and actually went forward, and that's when this wife saw her is because she'd gone forward to accept the Lord. And, um, and I think that's kind of why the meeting worked out. But Anyway, so sometimes you can bring somebody to the Lord if, if you've got a right heart attitude, and that's what these are all about. Does anybody have any other questions? Are you ever supposed to tell someone you forgive them without them asking? 
Well, I mean, I think I think that there wouldn't be any harm to that. It might it might cause it might that might cause a problem. So boy, I'd be led by the spirit on that. And um, I've actually done that myself in my own life. But boy, you know, the timing was right, and the person accepted it, and actually took my arm, and we began. We sat down, and we began to talk. So sometimes that can work out, but I I can see where that would you, you know be ready for the response is what I would say to you. I think my uh, question is just about the same as mine is that I thought I heard them say that if you had wronged someone, sinned against them, but it is not come to light and they don't know it, but you realize it and you've been convicted of it, you've asked for God's forgiveness, there is no reason to tell that person. Did I hear that? Well, Jim Newhouser was talking about the thought process, like our thinking. So in, a, so in your mind, if you've sinned by... Um, you know, looking lustfully at another woman or, or whatever that might be, coveting uh, somebody else's spouse or a car, what, you know, that sort of thing. That doesn't need to be, you don't need to run to that person and, and confess that sin. He's saying, you know, you ask God to forgive you. you, you if you're feeling a conviction, then you ask God to forgive you and God forgives you. So you don't necessarily have to run and tell the other person. All right. Uh I'm sure I probably wouldn't have to think very long before I could come up with a scenario where I sinned against somebody and didn't and, and ask forgiveness from God and never told them. But just to make it easier to talk about, uh, not very many years ago, I had someone come to me and ask my forgiveness for something they had been doing to sin against me. And of course, because that's what they had been taught. I didn't know about it, probably never would have known about it. But I've always been taught if you have, then you need to, even if they don't know it, that you or to go to them and ask their forgiveness. Is, is that what I heard him say? Well, he, yeah, yeah, he was saying that there's no, if there's not been any harm, right. if there's not been harm done to the other people, you know, to be the person that's involved or, or whatnot. Um, yeah, he's saying you don't have to confess everything. He kind of used the toothpaste example too, and the, you know about you know you don't have to. Um, make a big deal out of something like this as well. So it was kind of all in that same line. Of, he's trying to say, think about being the peacemaker when it comes to something like that, where it might cause uh, a lot of conflict. If you go to somebody, you go, oh, I've been sinning against you, and I just, I want to ask for your forgiveness, and you now you've startled them, and you've surprised them, and now here's going to come conflict. So I think that it was in the context of that. I think, so, um, on the flip side, I don't remember now if it was the last one or this one, but they bring up being able to overlook sins against you. And I think this might be kind of the flip side of that. Uh, you know, if it's trivial, if somebody commits a, a trivial sin against you, they hurt your feelings, they say something out of context, it's, it's better to overlook that than to pursue it. And I think there may be a flip side of that as far as going and pursuing, you know, uh, something you've done against somebody if it's trivial. And... Yeah. But yet at, at the same time, and I'm thinking out loud, and when I do that I get room in my mouth for both feet. Uh, but there has to be I mean, obviously, the first person you or the first one you've sinned against is the Lord. So there's where you go for forgiveness first, and then that second level is going to be the person that you you affected. And I mean, they even go into what if it's affected many people? You need to go to every one of those, and and you know ask forgiveness uh, and repent to each one of those. Uh, but I think there's some thought into, you know, ask forgiveness from the Lord. Okay, now, what's the outcome of my going to this person and saying, hey, look. What would be accomplished? In, other words? in a lot of cases, what would be accomplished? Because for one thing, if you told them, it might hurt them. Right. That's what. That's why I'm saying you, yeah. you weigh it out. I, I would. I think it would be definitely be a case by case situation. This particular case was, was really kind of funny because the person that was confessing all this stuff was actually confessing what he had done and another member 
who happened to be in the room at the same time too, <laughs> who was not, didn't regret anything he had done. <laughs> and um, so he dragged him under the bus <laughs> It was really kind of funny. Yeah, I didn't even get in there that day, I don't know. Did it affect you like in any, like financially? Uh... Yeah. They would get that. They would get. They didn't like me. They got. They would get. He would say, you know, "We got together and we would spend hours just trashing." Okay. Okay. See, <laughs> to me, uh, 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 okay. to me, was. that would be. That's a whole other scenario now. Okay. So you, it, we're talking about the unmet desires of our and motives and intentions of our heart. To me, that man wanted you to know exactly how he felt about you. So. so Right, in a roundabout way, and calling it godly. No, 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 no. Well, he was sincere. He didn't convict it. I mean, he was sincere in wanting to know my forgiveness. And the other guy Upset. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why I said it had to be a, a case by case deal, I, I think. But to me, I, I guess I would have to have met him, talked to him, and that kind of thing. But that seems like it was the wrong motives and intent, really. To me, it seems like that. Because if he's truly forgiven you, now he's going to treat you differently anyway. If he's, if he's, you know, or if he's sinned against you and he feels differently about you is what I'm trying to say, then he would be treating you in a godly Christian way. So sometimes, um, you know, you have to be careful about motives and intents. Like I would worry about what his true motives were for, for coming to you. <laughs> well, right. And I think that's Jim Newhouser's point. If it doesn't, you know, if it's not harmed you in any way. So. Yeah. There can be situations easily to where you've sinned in your heart against somebody. And, you know, you may be right. You may have been right, but yet you feel some conviction of sin. That person's not available anymore. Mm -hmm. So. The only, the only place you can go there is to the Lord. So. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Nope. I got trivia. You got a trivia question? Okay. Too, well, numbers. Any, anytime you see something repeated in reading, you think, well, that's, that's pretty important. And this covered repentance and forgiveness. So I, I was looking over here, the word, some form of the word repent or repentance in the New Testament alone appears 74 times. That's repetitive. That means it's important. Uh, now, just like the heart, I think the word heart's mentioned 700 times in the Bible. Forgive or forgiveness, <laughs> New Testament alone, 66 times. And part three is going to go into this in a lot more detail because he talks more about um, confronting sin as a way to be a peacemaker. So I think I'm going to this more with, with part three. So, Tom, you want to close us in prayer? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for uh, your presence with us, for the Spirit, Lord, that teaches and uh, helps us to learn. God, I thank you for your word, for the faithfulness, uh, for the for the truth of your word, Lord, um, for the steadfastness, the unchanging uh, rules, disciplines, guidances, Lord, the things that help us live and live rightly and live uh, to follow after Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we can turn to your word. Thank you for the people who's put in so much time to help us, to be able to help others. God, help us to look into our own hearts tonight uh, first and look into the mirror to see what's in our own minds. For you would help us, Lord, repent of sin and turn from it and, uh, and have a heart like Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.